So, good morning. I'm very happy to welcome you to the uh, Royal Economic Society annual conference and particularly to the presidential address which is about to start. My name is Mary Morgan from the London School of Economics. I'm here to chair the presidential address from Professor Tim Besley, who's our current president. Um, Tim is school professor at the LSE of political science, economics and pl of political science and the W. Arthur Lewis Professor of Development Economics in the Department of Economics at LSE. He's a member of the National Infrastructure Commission, a fellow of the Econometric Society, and a fellow of the British Academy. He's also a foreign honorary member of the American Economic Association and the American Academy of Arts and Science. I'm delighted to invite Tim to give his presidential address uh, to our conference, and I hand over now to Tim. Thank you very much, Mary. It's a uh Delight to be here, particularly in front of a, a live group at Reading, but also uh, um, welcome online. Um, I'm going to do something slightly unusual um, today. Normally, people use these kind of events to uh, talk about their past research and to sort of draw some conclusions and perhaps uh, um, publicize to some extent what they've done in the past. I'm doing the opposite. I'm actually talking about some things I've only been thinking about quite recently. Um, partly brought on by the, what we've all experienced in the last couple of years, but not exclusively so, but also speaking to what I think are going to be some of the major challenges over the, over the coming years in ways that I'll draw out. So this is really um, reporting on very much work in progress rather than work that I've uh, finished, and I'll, I'll particularly um, flag up what that work is in a moment. Um, the sort of starting point for what I'm talking about is the, um, that policy challenges frequently require citizens and government to cooperate or work together to solve policy problems. We often, when you listen to the way people discuss uh, policy problems in a popular way, it's often, what's the government going to do, uh, is the kind of mantra of solution of policy problems, rather than how do citizens have to work with government to solve problems. But I would argue in almost all interesting policy problems, there's an element needed where citizens and government uh, cooperate. And I call that the compliance problem. In most of economics, we tend to assume that compliance is about coercive force, that we need a strong state to compel people to do the kinds of things that we want them to do. Um, but if you think about reality, we, we often rely on voluntary, on quasi-voluntary, that's only partially complied with um, um, uh, strategies by government. And if you look at, you know, there's a whole range, I just give six examples in these bullet points. I mean, when you pay your taxes, of course, the assumption is we only pay our taxes because we're compelled to do so. But actually, if you go to the World Value Survey, and, you, and, and there's a question in the World Value Survey that's now been asked to well over 400,000 people, um, which is, do you think it's uh, justifiable to cheat on your taxes, even if you could get away with it? And well over 80% of the world's population believe the answer is it's not, it's, it's not appropriate to cheat on your taxes. And I think if, if, uh, if um, tax authorities were, rely, were exclusively relying on um, just their, their coercive enforcement power to raise taxes, it would be very hard to have the kinds of tax systems that we have that raise well in excess of 40% of GDP in many countries. I mean, an example, a more recent example, which I think will resonate with, with all of us, is policies around social distancing or mask wearing, where there was a huge reliance on voluntary compliance. And there was a certain amount of coercive compliance, but voluntary compliance was very important. In times of war, states rely very heavily on voluntary compliance. It asks people to come forward and volunteer for uh, military service, and they do typically do that in large numbers. In terms of coming challenges, reducing carbon emissions is going to be a huge challenge if we cannot get people to voluntarily comply with certain kinds of policies. It's not going to be feasible for governments to compel citizens wholesale. And uh, implementing sanctions, I guess a, a recent example requires um, those who are potentially being asked to enforce those sanctions to do so um, voluntarily, not relying exclusively on uh, government-based enforcement. Um, so I view this as a problem in political economy. Um, it's how can we get government working with citizens. And, and I'm, in today's lecture, I'm going to talk about um, how policy processes 
affect compliance and offer you a framework for thinking about that. Um, and what, sort of in a bigger picture sense, what's interesting, uh, I think, about th this way of, of thinking is that politics isn't, economists are very rude about politics very often. They think of politics sort of getting in the way of good economic policy. But I'm going to argue here that actually po policy uh, that, that comes and is generated through a political process might actually sometimes have a much better chance of being successful than policy that's just handed down from on high in the sort of classic social planner model that economists know and love and that I have still teach to my students. So I view there's this sort of third branch and, 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 and Mary, who, who introduced me, um, is, is a, a very distinguished historian of, of, of economics and she assures me that I'm, I'm not necessarily going to the oracle when it comes to sources. But I first learned this term, the art of political economy, by reading not um, Maynard Keynes, of course, who's the most famous Keynes, but, but John Neville Keynes, who is his father, who wrote this book called The Scope and Method of Political Economy, published at the end of the 19th century, um, where he made this distinction between normative economics, positive economics, and the art of political economy. And I've been very intrigued what the art of political economy is. He says, when we pass to problems of taxation or problems that concern the relations of the state with trade or industry or the general discussion of communistic and socialistic schemes, it's far from being the case that economic considerations hold the field exclusively. Account must be taken of the ethical, social, and political considerations that lie outside the sphere of political economy regarded as a science. Um, and to some extent today, I'm kind of populating this extra space, this middle space between norm normative and positive with the art of political economy. So what I'm going to do is put forward a framework for thinking about the role of policy processes and policy choice, where compliance is at the heart of it and can be quasi-voluntary, and I'll explain that. Um, the model is going to basically be one in which a government has a policy agenda, which it requires compliance with. Citizens have heterogeneous views about whether the policy is worthwhile or not. Think, you know, do we really need this lockdown? Um, they're, are more, they're more likely to comply with a policy which they're convinced is in the public interest. Um, and government must then choose a level of coercive compliance alongside understanding the extent of voluntary compliance. That's the basic framework. And uh, where the policy process is going to come in is in, and you'll see how this works, in, in aligning views between citizens and government. And that alignment is going to be critical, and I'll relate it to some ideas uh, in, in, in various literatures. So I'm this, the, 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 the talk's based on three different papers, one, all of which are sort of to some extent um, in progress. The, 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 I guess the, the main thing, the main model is in this paper called An Economic Model of Deliberative Democracy, which I'm just finishing up. Um, but it also was developed in some work with my, uh, one of my PhD students called Trust and Compliance with, with Sasha Dre. And I'll talk a little bit at the end, although I put it in parentheses because I think I probably won't get to it, on some work I'm doing at the moment on narratives and guidance via narratives by, by government. But in general, it's heavily influenced by work um, by, by people I, I've, I've worked a lot with and talk a lot to, Margaret Levy, um, Torsten Persson, and, and Jim Robinson. Um, so I'm going to provide an overview of the main ideas, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what the different work does. Um, it's a kind of portable framework, I would argue, with some wide applicability, um, and it connects to an area I've worked on at least for more, well, more than 10 years now on the origins of state effectiveness. What, what does it take to have states that can actually deliver on the things that we want them to do? And I've argued for a long time that economists have been very naive in, 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 their, in the way they've thought about this, that we have lots of views about policies, but we have much weaker views about how to implement those policies. And a central issue in political economy is being able to plug that distance between the design of policy and the effective implementation of policy by, through political or, uh, or administrative processes. Um, so, uh, so that's how, how it's going to work. Um, there's lots of political economy out there. I'm not going to, this isn't a review of the, the literature, but one of the things, and I'll, and I'll try and come to this a little bit at the end that, that, that kind of I want to fit into the agenda I'm talking about today, is how different forms of political institutions that we've been studying for a long time, um, things like independent agencies, 
um, the design of electoral systems, parliamentary procedures, etc., fit into trying to deal with these situations where compliance is such a, such a central issue. And actually, in some work I'm doing at the moment with the, um, the, uh, the Asian Infrastructure Bank and the World Bank on um, state capacity and climate action, um, this comes out really very clearly that if we're going to have effective climate action around the, go around the, the world, we need to understand, I'm going to claim, the issues we're talking about today. Political economy, and this is a kind of critique, not my critique, but it's one, if you, if you look at the literature, which is in predominantly in political science on deliberative democracy, and I'll be clear what deliberative democracy is a little later, um, they criticize economists in particular, but uh, I guess a whole branch of political economy being obsessively um, uh, worried about preference aggregation. How do we get from the fact that people have competing views about issues towards a solution? Not enough about how do we actually align people's preferences? Um, and, and, and the deliberative democracy movement is all about, well, actually, if we talk to each other, we'll get better preference alignment. We don't just take those preferences as fixed and given and beyond our, our capability to, to influence. Um, OK. Um, I'm going to contrast two ways of thinking about state effectiveness. Um, the one that I guess for most of the work I've done in this area, particularly the work I've done with Torsten Pearson, has been the tradition, which has been thinking about state effectiveness as top-down investment in monitoring and compliance. And there's certainly not an in incorrect view. So if you read, the, there's um, you know, a whole literature on how did the fiscal state arrive in the, in the UK in particular, because one of the reasons why the UK had the strongest navy in the world for uh, quite a long period of time was it's because it could raise large amounts of tax revenue to build ships and employ people to go in those ships. And, uh, and that was all underpinned by the, uh, by the fiscal system. So if you read Patrick O'Brien's work, he's an economic historian, you'll see really lots of very interesting insights into building, to some extent, that state effectiveness through um, institutional arrangements that made sure that the people who owed the money to the state actually paid it. So I'm not going to belittle the idea of a top-down model of state effectiveness. Um, but there's a kind of different tradition of state effectiveness, which emphasizes much more the state as a social contract of some element of, con of, of people voluntarily complying with what the state wants them to do, um, where they, they think about the state as a form of mutual obligation. I, I will do my bit if government treats me well and my fellow citizens treat me well, et cetera. And there are famous thinkers more in the top-down tradition of people like Hobbes and Weber, and in the bottom-up tradition of people like Locke and, and Rousseau. And to some extent, what I'm talking about today is more in the tradition of, of a kind of contractarian tradition. Um, it'll have elements of both, but it's going to stress the limitations of the, of the view, but not view them as juxtaposed necessarily, just uh, uh, incomplete. Okay, so now I'm going to get on to some formalities. The very, very simple framework, the simplest I could think of to start investigating these issues. Um, there's a policy intervention, um, which I'm going to just uh, denote as lambda, an element of zero, one. So the government's going to think of it, simplest model, think of the government's going to announce a lockdown or it's not going to announce a lockdown. Um, and there's some value of this policy if it goes ahead. Um, there's a state of the world which is called, is a lockdown really needed to combat COVID-19? Uh, and in, in the simple world, you can think of that as being zero or one. If a lockdown's needed, it has benefits of capital delta. If you implement a lockdown when it's not really needed, when sigma is equal to zero, you actually have an, a, a loss. The economy suffers and there's no great benefit to fighting the pandemic. So those are the two two extreme views, either yes, yeah, it's a good idea to have a lockdown, the, the benefits exceed the cost, or it's a bad idea to have a lockdown because the cost of the economy is too high. Okay, so intervention is worthwhile. If we all knew the answer, uh, whether a lockdown was a good idea, then we know what to do. We just get our government to go ahead with the thing that's the right thing to do, um, and, uh, and that, would be, that would be that. Except for the fact that we're gonna need people to comply with the lockdown if we have it. So that's gonna, where the compliance problem is going to come in. Um, so the true state of the world is, is mostly uncertain. Um, we don't know whether the policy that, that the government is going to implement is justified or not. 
So if there's a probability X that the policy is worthwhile, as we are in the state where it's worthwhile, then the value of that policy is X times delta minus one minus X times little delta. So that's, that's giving us the expected value of the policy um, for someone who has probability X. Okay, I'm going to divide citizens into two groups. I'm going to call them a supportive group and a skeptical group. The supportive group um, have some priors that the policy is a good idea. Oops, what happened there? Can someone just cancel? Yeah, thank you. I, I think I probably created the problem there. So the, um, the supportive group have uh, belief capital pi, that this policy is worthwhile, and the skeptical group little pi, which is below big pi, are, are unsure, uh, are less sure. And indeed, in, you'll see in a minute, I'm going to make the skeptical group uh, think that this policy is a bad idea. But anyway, we'll, we'll come to that in a second. So citizens, so unlike a very standard economic model, citizens are going to care when they decide whether to comply what the value of the policy is. So if you can convince me that a lockdown is a good idea, I as a citizen am more likely to comply with that even if it's costly for me to do so, okay? So citizens in this world are gonna be potentially pro-social. Um, and there's a variety of different models. I've worked on some, but I guess Benabu and Tyrol and others have worked on, on models where you have this sort of partly pro-social obligation element to your, your preferences. Um, so, but individuals are gonna face the cost of complying. Even if you think it's a good idea, you know, you still can't go out to the restaurant. So, you know, you're gonna face the cost of complying and that's gonna be distributed on zero E. Um, for each citizen, um, there's gonna be a cost of compliance. Um, we're gonna allow the state to encourage compliance by imposing a cost, a fine, or a, uh, if you wanna think of it that way, an expected fine by not complying with the policy. Um, or it could be an inducement. You could give people grants to, um, to comply with the policy, but I'm gonna focus on the case where there's a cost um, and that's not indexed by group. So you can't tell whether somebody is a skeptic or a supporter. You've got to impose the same regime on everybody. Okay, so if you're gonna invest in monitoring compliance, you're not gonna be able to just target one group because you can't observe them ex ante. Okay, so that's, that's the framework. Um, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. Um, what about government? Well, government's also going to be potentially uncertain whether this is a good policy. Um, for all the guys who appear on the stage, the experts, and tell us that a lockdown is a good idea, you know, one doesn't feel those guys necessarily know either. They may have a better idea than some citizens whether a lockdown's a good idea, but they're certainly not completely, completely uh, sure. Um, and so there's some, they have some view, which could be that they know the state, so it could be zero or one, um, that a lockdown or the policy is a good idea, but it not, needn't be correct. However, government is gonna be basically benevolent, meaning it doesn't, it doesn't deliberately wanna do something bad. It actually wants to do the right thing. It just doesn't necessarily know what the right thing is. So government is benevolent, but not necessarily omniscient, okay? Um, so what's the government's objective function? It's gonna care about the fraction of people who comply times the value of the policy. So the policy is gonna be more valuable when more people comply with it. But it also cares about the costs it's imposing on citizens from complying. So it's benevolent to the extent that it doesn't wanna impose a policy necessarily if it's very, very costly for citizens to actually go along with that policy. Um, there's also going to be a cost of going ahead with the policy uh, if it goes ahead, and this is and there's going to be a cost of imposing compliance, and that's going to be in the end that comes back to the citizens in the form of taxation. Um, so we're going to assume that's uniformly uh, for them. Um, so how does the model work? So we're, we're nearly at a point where we can understand some some features of this incredibly simple model. First of all, nature just draws a set of parameters, the fraction of people who are skeptics or uh, supporters, the beliefs of those guys and the beliefs of government. Then government's gonna choose a policy and an enforcement level, and then citizens will choose whether to, to, to comply given the enforcement level. Some may choose not to comply. If enforcement's very low, they still, they decide not to, not to go along with the policy. And the reason why compliance matters to government, just to reinforce this, because it's important to bear this in mind, is because the government cares about rho, the fraction of citizens who comply, because that determines the value of the policy. Okay, 
So all we need to do now is to figure out what happens, and it's, you know, I'm going to go through this quite quickly. Um, I'm, I'm, I know I've got limited time anyway. Um, so I'm going to go through this quite quickly so I can get on to some of the applications and to show you this is a useful framework for thinking through a few issues. Citizens will comply if their beliefs about this being the right policy, thus the cost of compliance is bigger than the penalty they face if they choose not to comply, which is minus phi, you know, the possibility they'll get you know, one of those notices in the mail we've heard about recently in the 20 pound or 200 pound, I can't remember what the fine is, um, from, uh, from the Metropolitan Police or whatever. Um, that's what you get if you, if you decide to show up to a party during lockdown. Okay, so that's going to be your calculus when you decide what to do. Do you think you're doing the right or the wrong thing? Is it costly to, to, to comply? And what's the potential formal cost? So that's going to give us, it's this slightly clunky expression because I'm assuming a uniform distribution epsilon. So you have, why have I got all this sort of max and min thing in here? Because you could have complete compliance. So rho is one in the particular group or rho can be zero. So all I'm taking into account is some group could complete, be completely non-compliant or some group could be com fully compliant. So that's why I've got that mess in. But the bottom line is the thing that's going to drive compliance in the interior is going to be, is the fine for not complying large enough and are, uh, do I have beliefs I'm doing the right or the wrong thing? Um, and aggregate compliance in the model is going to be the fraction of supporters of the policy who have uh, this compliance rate and the fraction of skeptics who have this compliance rate. Okay, and the thing to notice is in this model, um, the supportive citizens, because they're more likely to believe this is a worthwhile policy for any given level of fine, are going to be more likely to comply with the policy than the skeptical citizens, because the, the, the delta hat is higher for the... For the, um, for the um, for the uh, uh, supportive citizens. So increasing citizens, so, so imagine a world where you can convince the supportive citizens this is really good policy, then they're more likely to comply because they now think they're doing the right thing. But equally, if citizens who are skeptics become more convinced that this is the wrong policy, they'll tend to comply even less, okay? And I'm gonna focus now on what I'm gonna regard as the most interesting case is where the, um, uh, the supporters think the policy is worthwhile to some extent, so their delta hat is positive, but the skeptics think it's, think it's the wrong policy, so delta hat is negative. In other words, they're putting more weight on the little delta. Okay? Um, and that's going to imply that if you don't enforce the policy, you'll get some level of compliance from the supporters, so if you, if you choose phi equals zero, whereas you'll get no compliance out of the skeptics. They'll just ignore the policy. They're all those guys that you write on the tube, uh, who are just sitting there without their masks on, even though there's a big sign up that says, please wear your mask on the tube. Okay, so now we've, we're almost there. Um, I'm going to describe what I'm calling uh, currently the paternalistic utilitarian objective, which means that what, what governments do when they pick the level, so gov government's going to choose whether to have the policy, is it worthwhile to have the policy at all, and second of all, how much to enforce it. And uh, this is the value of the policy which they use their own estimate of the policy value. So that's why it's paternalistic, because they're not, they're not trying to aggregate uh, citizens' preferences. They're using their own view of what is the right thing to do, which could be very different from the citizens' view. So, so that's why the value of the policy is done at the, citizen, uh, the government's belief. Um, but then they care about all the costs they're imposing on citizens. So the citizens are having to comply, that's this thing here, and also they're going to have to punish their citizens, which, you know, in principle they don't like because that lowers the, ci the citizens' utility. So they're utilitarian, but they're slightly paternalistic because they, they use their own views uh, about what the right thing to do. So it's not purely aggregation, but it does care about the disutility that the citizens are experiencing. And then the thing to notice is if, if you intensify compliance costs a little bit, so you invest in compliance, this is just sort of uh, accounting, really. You're going to either in, enhance the in compliance of the supportive group or the skeptical group, and this is going to be the value, and I'll come back to this in a minute, of, of increasing compliance a little bit. Okay, so what's citizen going to do? Well, if we take a standard model of optimal policy making, they're going to choose the, the level of compliance that maximizes the value less the cost of 
uh, investing in compliance. And we get immediately this result, which, which might seem um, counterintuitively immediately, that you'll go to one of the extremes. Um, the model predicts you'll either do no compliance and rely entirely on voluntary compliance, so then you're only going to get anything from the supportive citizens, or you'll go to the extreme of getting the all citizens to fully comply with it, in which case you, you choose a very draconian level of compliance. Um, and in a more general model, you can have interior solutions, but in this model, you only have these extreme solutions, um, which means you either have the voluntary situation or the extreme enforcement situation. And then given the optimum level of, of uh, enforcement, you choose to go ahead with the policy if it's worthwhile given the cost you have to pay. Now, why, the next slide should show me, show me yeah. Why, why do you get these two extremes? Um, well, with the, with the um, uh, supportive citizens, you get some amount of compliance for free. Um, and uh, if, um, the government thinks it's worthwhile to have the policy, there's always the option of just relying on the support of citizens um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and therefore getting some compliance. Now imagine increasing a little bit the value of compliance. Well, you're going to increase compliance am among both groups. In fact, you weren't getting any compliance at all from the, um, from the skeptical group. Uh, and you get a kind of cost-benefit analysis is, is is forcing compliance out of the non-compliant citizens, given the cost of doing so, a good idea or not? And that's what this calculation at the bottom is. It's the cost-benefit ratio. What's the cost-benefit ratio depend on? Well, the government would, in this example I've given, where the government is a support, is, has the same beliefs as the supportive citizen, you're getting some increased value because you're getting more compliance. You're having to force it out of the, um, out of the uh, skeptical citizens. So you get a kind of cost-benefit ratio, and if this is favorable, you'll force compliance out of the whole citizenry. And what level of compliance will you choose? Well, that was in the previous slide, which I'm not really, but it's going back and forth. You'll choose a level of compliance, which depends on how skeptical the skeptical citizens are, because to force full compliance out of them, you need to not just promise the fine, you need to overcome an even greater threshold, because they're all thinking they're doing the right thing by not complying. So you're having to push, push, the, push the threshold even higher. Okay, so, um, uh, so now you can ask, okay, under what conditions do you get which, which solution? Do you get the voluntary compliance solution or the enforcement solution? And I, none of this is very surprising. If you have a lot of supportive citizens, you're going to more likely go for the, comp the, the voluntary compliance solution. If the government and the supportive citizens are in strong agreement with each other, you are more likely to get the voluntary compliance ar ar arrangement. And if pi is lower, in other words, um, you're, you're, it's very, very costly to get those skeptical citizens on board, you're more likely to stick with voluntary compliance. It just becomes too expensive to invest in a level of compliance that would force the arch skeptics who just believed you know, pan the, the pandemic was all a fabrication, you'll never get them on board, so you, you're more likely to rely on voluntary compliance in that case. Okay, um, so, so, what's the, so this is the kind of core, core model, uh, and I'm going to spend the last few minutes that I have um, showing you how this can be a useful framework for thinking about what I'm calling the art of political economy. Even though government is essentially benevolent, it does care about what citizens believe. Why does it care about what citizens believe? Well, partly intrinsically, um, because it affects the cost. You know, citizens are miserable forcing them to do something they don't like to do. And if you're, you might be paternalistic, but if you care about the fact that citizens are suffering in a world you're forcing them to do things they don't really want to do, you should take that into account. And so the policy is less viable as a utilitarian, if we take the utilitarian core idea, if citizens really don't want the policy. So forcing it on, an un, on, a, on a group of citizens who don't like it is, is, means it's less welfare enhancing. But you also care instrumentally about it. That's the intrinsic reason to care about what citizens think, and that's because compliance is higher when citizens believe more strongly in the policy you're trying to implement. And that's a kind of 
these two features, I, I'm not aware of any model previously that has these two features, which is what I want to focus on. So if, you, if citizens are convinced the policy is a good idea, they're more willing to comply, and finding ways of convincing citizens can then be important, and that's where we come back to the art of political economy, is convincing citizens that what they're doing is actually valuable. At least that's the way I, I want to interpret it. So let me do very two very quick applications, one of which has some empirical component. I'll start with deliberative democracy. Um, I like to call this slide from the agora to arrow. So what was the agora? The agora was in ancient Greece, the meeting place, the, com the cultural meeting place for society in ancient Greece, which is the center of athletic, artistic, business, and social and spiritual meeting in which people got together and they deliberated policy. They tried to decide among themselves in this sort of slightly romanticized version that, that, that's been handed down to us about life in, in ancient Greece. Um, and, and they tried to find a way through difficult policy problems working together. And that kind of is the ideal of deliberative democracy. We talk to each other, we try and reach a consensus, and we then make doing policy easier. Um, and there's a lot of people out there, not many economists in this list, um, who've talked a lot about um, the public sphere and about the role of deliberation in policy making. Um, Rawls, in his later book, not The Theory of Justice, but his later book, the title is eluding me now, um, talks a lot about the role of public reason. Um, Habermas, who's a critical theorist, talks a lot about the, the importance of a vibrant public sphere within a democratic setting where people um, state their views publicly in debate and uh, disagree and try and reach a consensus. But if you go back, you can see these ideas in J.S. Mill and Badgett and other people. Um, and uh, the model I've just put up, I would argue, is a good framework for beginning to think about this. There's a very famous book by Goodman and Thompson, um, and, and I like their definition of what deliberative democracy is. They talk about it as a form of government which free and equal citizens and their representatives justify decisions in a process in which they give one another reasons that are mutually acceptable and generally accessible with the aim of reaching decisions that are binding on all at present but open to challenge in the future. But it's basically, in a nutshell, it's a democracy where there's, there's opportunities for citizens to, to actually express their views. And it's used, uh, this has become quite a popular idea, not just within uh, political theory, which, I mean, a lot of the people who dominated the debate originally are political theorists who, who, who think of it as a normatively valuable way of uh, of, um, of, of, of making policy, but uh, it's also become increasingly used. So actually on the National Infrastructure Commission, which Mary mentioned I sit on, we did some work, some deliberation work on public transport and road user charging, uh, particularly congestion charging, trying to figure out what citizens' views were about the use of those, um, what, what, if, if you started to introduce more congestion pricing in cities, would, would citizens be willing to go ahead, go along with that policy? Well, it turned out we learned through the deliberative process that the answer was yes, as long as you could commit somehow to more of the revenues that you generated being used to improve the quality of public transport. And that was a kind of deliberative process where we brought experts and citizens together to try and, uh, to try and um, uh, untangle what, what people really believe. Um, but in fact, if you... Look, this is an OECD report that came out uh, a couple of years ago called um, um, Innovative Citizen Participation in New D Democratic Institutions, Catching the Deliberative Wave. Um, you'll see that, that there was a quite a big, uh, it, there's been quite a big increase in what they classify are deliberative procedures being used within the OECD as part of a policy process. Um, and and uh, so they argue that this is a kind of, as they say, a new wave of, of thinking. So, um, did I go the wrong way? Uh, okay, there we go. So how do can we think about deliberative democracy in this framework? Well, a very simple way, and I'm just going to sketch this. I've, so I've written a, or in the process of writing a paper just on this topic. Imagine in, it, the point at which you uh, you announce a policy, you then allow the citizens to deliberate the value of that policy among themselves, and that's going to potentially affect 
not only the views of the citizens, but also even the views of the government. The government may not know what citizens actually believe. So part of deliberative democracy is not one way. It's not you send in your enforcer who just sort of beats the, the citizens into submission. Maybe it's also about the government learning from, uh, from what the citizens believe, and they can actually shift their own views on policy uh, as a consequence of deliberation. So that's going to give you new values of these parameters, and then the government will then decide whether to implement the policy in the level of coercion. And the thing to observe in a framework like this, that can have a real impact on policy. If you are able, by some method, to shift citizens' views. Uh, in particular, the, if you read Habermas, um, uh, his views of deliberative democracy is deliberative democracy will ultimately generate a social consensus. I think that's kind of an extreme take either on, both on Habermas and on the real world. There's no reason to believe if we talk to each other for long enough, we're going to, in the end, all agree. I don't think that's an axiom of deliberation. But suppose that was true. Suppose we all end up agreeing and we all end up becoming supportive citizens. If only we'd had enough presentations from Chris Whitty and Patrick, uh, sorry, what's his name, the chief scientist? Um, oh, what's his name? Patrick Valance, we would all have become you know, very clearly converted to the view that lockdown was a good idea. All citizens would have agreed, and then when we went on the tube, there wouldn't be a single unmasked person on the tube. Uh, so you get to gamma equals 1 and psi equals pi in this with full consensus. And in that world, you'll always reach a voluntary compliance solution, and as long as this condition holds, policy will go ahead. So that's a kind of slightly trivial case. In, in, in my work on this, I've explored lots of other possibilities, and I extend the model and have things like protests and other things going on. But, but basically, the idea is you can use this to investigate how deliberative procedures would or would not affect policy in different, in different ways. OK, my last thing I want to talk about briefly, so you'll see how this fits in, is trust and compliance. Again, non-economists, non I've been very influenced by Margaret Levy, who I mentioned earlier in, in, in the talk, who's a political scientist from Stanford. She's worked a lot on. Um, the importance of building trust and legitimacy in government as a vehicle for improving the quality of government policy, not just as a, a nice to have, because intrinsically, governments that people trust are going to be able to implement policies both more effectively uh, and more welfare uh, in enhancing policies. Well, this model can make sense of that. Suppose there's two kinds of governments. There's trustworthy governments who are definitely going to maximize uh, welfare and there's untrustworthy governments that some of the time willfully, for whatever reasons, it could be because they're lobbied or they're um, just incompetent, choose the wrong policy, in the, even though they may be informed about what the right policy is. So I, I explore that model by supposing that the, the, the government does know what to do. It knows the right state of the world, but some of the time it doesn't actually get to implement the right thing. And let chi be the probability the government is trustworthy. And what you can do, and I'm just going to do this very quickly, and I apologize because I just want to end on an empirical note, um, is you can then say, using Bayes' rule, what is your updated belief? If you see the government implement the policy, and I'm a citizen, if I think the government is trustworthy, I'm always going to think the policy is only implemented when it's a good idea. So that's going to increase my belief that they're doing the right thing. But if I think some of the time an untrustworthy government would be choosing this policy, that's going to contaminate my inference. That's what this term here does. And so that may then endogenously affect what government can do. So governments will, if it, think about a lockdown, um, governments will be able to implement a policy that where they can have more lockdowns because they can have more voluntary compliance because citizens trust them only to be doing lockdowns when they're really warranted. So you kind of get a virtuous policy circle. Um, so increasing trust will tend to increase voluntary compliance. It will reduce compliance costs, make it more likely that lambdas won, and increases the parameter range for which that happens and also the, the likelihood the policy goes ahead. Okay, so just some, so in case you thought that I was just sort of fabricating this sort of trust and uh, trust story, that, let me just end with a little bit of evidence on that. Um, people who trust their government were much more likely, and I'm going to show you some very quick evidence on this, to socially distance through the pandemic, be willing to give part of their income to the environment, volunteer, say they'll volunteer to fight for their country and are willing to pay their taxes voluntarily. Um, and the broad, there's broad cross-country and within-country evidence. I'm just going to show you one 
saying on this because I'm not going to have time to go through all of it. Here's a chart from the government's uh, COVID-19 longitudinal survey based on five cohorts over two waves between May 2020 and March 2021. And there's a whole series of outcome variables you can look at, but this is compliance with social distancing, and this is whether people say they trust government. And across the board, you get a very strong positive correlation. I've added more and more controls as we go across the way. This is joint work with Sasha Dre, as I said. But even if you put in individual fixed effects, so you would t look at the same individuals um, uh, surveyed over time, and so this is entirely identified off shifting trust attitudes among citizens, you get a strong positive correlation between trust in government and compliance with social distancing. Um, you get a similar pattern when you look at, um, uh, there we go, uh, data from the World Value Survey on things like willingness to give your some income, part of your income for the environment, um, uh, willingness to say you're willing to fight for your country, and um, uh, uh, willingness to pay taxes. Um, I, okay. And if you look at cross-country patterns, you find a similar thing. So if you look at a principal component of those compliance decisions, the three I just showed you, and just uh, uh, have the level of voluntary compliance here and confidence in government, you can, con you can condition on cross-country covariates that you observe a, an upward sloping relationship between confidence in government and voluntary compliance. So I think these ideas are not just um, theoretically interesting, but I would argue linked to what we know um, from the data. Okay, I'm going to leave this. I'd love to talk about this. We'll probably take another whole other lecture. Uh, to talk about narratives, which I think are interesting. Um, why can't I get that to move? Okay, so I'm gonna conclude now. Um, what I've tried to uh, present to you is a framework for thinking about endogenous policy choices with compliance. It uh, emphasizes the interplay between the beliefs of citizens and optimal policy. You can't talk about a policy separately from what the citizens believe about that policy. It can, I, I hope I've convinced you there's a wide range of areas where it can be applied. Um, and I, there's many other applications. As I said earlier, I'm doing some work on participating in protests as a version of non-compliance. If you really don't like a policy, you'll go out to the streets and you'll complain about it. That's a sort of form of non-compliance. Um, this one, slightly tongue in cheek, uh, whether the government calls a referendum uh, when citizens don't comply with what they want them to do. Uh, the government clearly wanted one outcome, but they couldn't persuade the citizens to go along with the outcome that they thought was the, the outcome that they desired. And um, I think it's also linked, the framework is linked to some debates in populism. What happens when elites start doing things that citizens are very remote from and don't feel they're part of? Uh, again, one of the core, I think, issues in populism is having elites who believe they can do anything without their citizens having to uh, go along with it. So I, I, I would argue that, the, that these ideas are, should be part of our economic policy framework, uh, and they haven't been emphasized enough. Maybe I've kind of been drawn to this because of what's been going on in the pandemic, but I think uh, even wider than that, these are issues that have always been there. They just get noticed more at certain times. So thank you for that. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. That was very interesting. Thought produces lots of possible things to, to develop and think about. Um, I'm very happy to call for questions from the floor here in Reading, and we've also got open the questions uh, online. So we hope that both our online uh, participants and our um, physical participants will have uh, suggestions they'd like to put to Tim. I'm sure there's lots of um, expansions to his his framework that people will want to draw. Um, questions from the floor? Yes, sorry, I can't. Yes. Oh, hold on, there's a... Yeah, there's a roving mic, a roving so mic. maybe just wait till the mic comes, yeah. because otherwise the people online won't, won't be able to hear your question. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, thank you for that presentation. Um, so my name's Jasmine, and I'm an apprentice economist at the Department for International Trade. So my question um, relates to like how you would like ideally like to see this um, implemented practically in government because at the moment with the way um, like 
cost benefit analysis is done, that's not really a consideration. Um, so yeah, that's my question. Okay, so I assume everyone heard the questions. How, do, how would this modify? Well, to some extent, it would suggest you have to modify the way you do cost benefit analysis to if, if, if the cost benefit analysis is premised on particular behavioral responses, which will only be forthcoming if people are convinced that the policy is valuable. Now, if you build a road junction, I doubt very much it matters very much whether you know, people are going to change their <laughs> compliance behavior. For certain kinds of policies, it would make a, a big difference whether they're worthwhile condition on that. But it also, I think it, it underlines the importance of the, again, the art of political economy, the processes that you would put in place prior to that policy being implemented, to what extent you bring in stakeholders, you listen to their views, you convince them that this is a policy that's worthwhile, rather than just sort of handing down a policy that you've claimed in, in the civil service. You've all, because you're incredibly clever, think that everybody should just uh, adopt the policy and accept it because you're, 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 you've done some analysis. I mean, it does also link to issues around transparency. To what extent do you make the analytics underpinning what you've, what, what the policy that you've implemented accessible? Now, it's all right. There's, there's a d debate in, here between the role of experts and the role of citizens, because sometimes experts are very sniffy about what citizens believe and therefore say, well, we couldn't possibly show um, the citizens or the analysis because they wouldn't understand it. But, you know, I think we need to try harder as experts that we need to, we need to not be snooty about the need for us to try and engage with and convince citizens and to build some trust in experts, not just in trust in government. So, so I think it just puts more onus on those who are in the policy process to spend more time thinking about that. And I don't just mean the sort of narrow politics of it, because you know, how it's going to hit my constituents isn't the right answer either. It's how you present the, sort of the, the proper case, if you like, which balances up all the different considerations. But it's a real challenge. There's no simple way of doing it. But, but the, the framework would suggest that we probably don't spend, as economists, maybe it, Non-economists spend more time on them than this, but as economists, I'm not sure we spend the requisite amount of time on worrying about, about these things. Mind you, there's, no, sorry, just one quick anecdote. Um, be careful what you wish for. So there was a, a, one of the early deliberation exercises that I heard about was in Bolivia, where they decided that they would talk to the parents of a school about the, how to in, spend the enhanced school budget. And they assumed, you know, they'd have a reasoned debate about, you know, more textbooks, more computers, whatever. And it turned out that the thing the parents wanted above everything else was a really good football coach, um, and uh, which could have been rational from an economic point of view if they thought their kids would make it to the Premier League. But the fact is that, that they, they went off deliberative procedures very fast when they discovered that that's the answer it yielded. Hmm. Thank you very much. It was a great yeah. question. Could you move the... Uh and also, can I, while I have this moment, can I encourage uh, the virtual audience to put in some questions? We have Giovanni here waiting for all your questions, so please, please come forward. Um, thank you. Would you like to say who you are first? Thanks. Yeah, so uh, my name is Clément Mendodier from the University of Vienna. And um, uh, it's a very re uh, exciting research agenda, so uh, exciting to see what comes out of it. Uh, one part I was curious about is you showed this application to trust in government, uh, and in this application, you assume that uh, the government might be benevolent or not, but the citizens in this uh, case agreed, uh, which I assume was just for simplicity of exposition. But I feel like in a lot of situations, it's in the case where citizens don't agree that this really plays a role, because then they would observe what the government does, update their beliefs about the benevolence of the government, but then end up disagreeing, and there's this polarization where uh, some citizens think this is the right thing to do because it's the government they agree with and the others don't. So I was wondering what no, you think a, of this. That's a great, a great question. And um, so I've, I, the answer is I don't really know how to, I mean, so, okay, what do I know how to deal with? At the moment, I've sort of slightly taken the soft option here because I'm work, working on a common values situation where in principle, everybody could agree this is the right policy if, they were, if, if their beliefs were aligned. That's only a certain class of policies. There may be a class of policies where no matter how aligned people's beliefs are, their fundamental preference is very um, opposed. Um, I'm, I'm mainly interested in the for format, and I, but I'm not claiming all policies have, have that flavor by any, by any means. Now, of course, one could therefore add in 
that element into this model. But I think what's more interesting, and that, which is deeper, is whether people who have diametrically opposed policies still find it valuable to deliberate and to, and to reach some accommodation, at least at, on, on the fairness of the process. So, so let me give you an example, very close to home example. When we, when we make faculty appointments at the LSE, we have a meeting and we debate you know, among ourselves which appointments to make. Um, and we don't agree, typically. I mean, everyone has their own views, and that's fine. Um, but we reach a decision. But I would claim that, that even though we don't agree, the fact that we've had this opportunity to deliberate and air our differences means everybody accepts the decision, uh, that it was done in an open and transparent way. People were able to express their views, even if they don't get their way. That isn't in this framework yet, but I sort of feel that's an interesting idea. And if you read political science literature in this space, um, they will talk a lot in psychology literature. They'll talk a lot about it's the process that, that's important, not necessarily the beliefs you have after that process. You may not shift your views, but you accept the proce procedural outcome. And I think that's an interesting idea, which I don't know how to, how to accomplish. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question over here. Can you pass the mic along, please? Thank you. Can you say who you are? Hi, um, my name is Shihang. I'm from the University of Oxford. So I have two sort of quest questions about your work on deliberative democracy. First is, um, how should we think about the costs of deliberation? So in the context of masks, if we had a consultation about it, I might have missed the peak of the crisis. Obviously, there's a time dimension. And um, the second is a related thought, which is that in many debates uh, where there is a lot of de deliberation, for example, in homeowners associations or in local places about like building of new things, um, the deliberation can lead to a kind of paralysis or a tendency towards like conservativeness. So I don't know whether you have any thoughts in your framework about those issues. So th they're all things I talk about in the paper that I, I flagged up. Uh, I'm not sure I have great answers to all of the questions, I, at least I think I can frame a little better than, than some of the, the, the existing debate the, the way to think about those, those issues. I mean, one is, clearly you're right, normally, so, so all those deliberative processes in that OECD report that I mentioned, they don't involve necessarily whole societies getting together with some sort of grand town meeting where everybody's online at the same time talking to each other. That's not realistic. What you tend to do is to have you know, small group deliberation. It can still be informative, even um, in terms of understanding better what the different cleavages are among citizens. There is a literature within the de deliberative democracy. Indeed, there's quite a lot of deliberative democracy experiments that show this, that you can sometimes just polarize opinion by having deliberation. It doesn't necessarily lead to consensus. And again, one can accommodate that within the framework. We maybe don't know ex ante where you'll get more consensus building versus where you'll get more um, po more polarization. Those are things we have to, d to discuss more. Maybe you know, if you think about the psychology of deliberation, you know, maybe we'll understand more. That's all part of an agenda that would help to resolve it. And also your issue about delay has got to be right too. I mean, we couldn't have had, I don't think, a fully joined up national conversation about mask wearing in the short period we had to decide to go down into, into lockdown. Um, but uh, I still think um, uh, we, we probably didn't have a sufficiently transparent and open debate but when we could have at least drawn breath because there were periods of relative relaxation. So maybe the, there, was, uh, there was an opportunity there to have more of a national conversation about the need for, for some of these things. I mean, one thing that's true, though, is the science was all over the place as well. So, you know, even though we deliberated with scientists, so a good example was I heard a I was on, on this advisory group in the run-up to, well, it was actually after the lockdown started, on, um, and, and there was a question that was pre-mask wearing as a, as a recommendation. And uh, the scientists on that group were saying, well, we can't recommend people wear masks because there's no randomized controlled trials that show masks are a good idea. Uh, and people pointed out, well, first of all, how long would it take to set up a randomized controlled trial? Uh, on masks now, uh, so we can wait six months before we do it. And it's a little bit like you know the, the Angus Deaton quip that we don't need a randomized controlled trial to show us that jumping out of a plane without a parachute is not a great idea. Um, you know, so the question of what, you know, when you can or you cannot um, do things in, in, in a timely way. But, but 
I still think it's focusing on the right issues. The art of political economy is the art of having those joined up discussions, not just assuming that we know best and we're going to do what we want. That's the general point. Mm. Um, thank you. I, we're, um, no questions from our virtual floor. So, um, Marina, perhaps you can bring it down. I'll come back to you. Um, thank you. Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, Marina Della Giusta, University of Reading. Um, my question is more about um, the role of trust there and beliefs. Uh, so, um, you know, I was looking at Italy being that little outlier there. I know for a fact people don't trust government very much, but they complied very much with mask wearing requirements and all the other requirements because essentially I think they believed that the government wanted to save their skin. And they had very aligned beliefs on how much they value a life and how much they value a life of a vulnerable person or perhaps an elderly person. There's a lot of intergenerational living and so on and so forth. And the impression I had here was that the government was testing how far it could push its citizens in how much they value life. <laughs> and, and also that citizens were not trusting government to look after their health very well because it had a very poor track record of protecting health, investing in the NHS and all the rest of it, and people felt a bit, you know. So very often what we saw was government giving not, not very conclusive advice, but citizens starting to wear masks anyway. You know, I'm thinking before Christmas, seeing people in the underground starting to wear masks way before it was suggested that they did it again. It was almost like we're all out looking out for ourselves here. So, um, so my question is really, you know, in, in a model like this, we think that the government knows the beliefs of citizens mm -hmm. and it just doesn't know which ones are going to comply or not. But in a way, governments, when they put out a policy prescription, are also testing how much they know <laughs> about citizens' beliefs. And they take feedback and then adjust policy. And it's that interaction, I wonder, whether you've started thinking about as well, dynamically, how this evolves. Mm -hmm. Tim, just before you answer that, can I get the mic moved to the back, please? I'll come, I'll come back to you. I think Mark has something. I'm sorry, yeah. Tim, to interrupt no, you. No, that's fine. Uh, again, great, great, great question. Um, so it, in a version, so I, in a version of this, you can do sort of beliefs over beliefs. <laughs> um, and these things are quite important where beliefs are not common knowledge. So, so in, the prote in the model of protest that I was talking about, one of, the, one of the things, even protesters don't know what other protesters think. So, so there's these nice models by um, Matt Jackson and Barbara, Barbara and Jackson model, where it's a sort of one of the reasons why protests don't happen is if sufficiently many people don't know how fed up other people really are. That's a kind of citizen to citizen thing, but the same thing applies as far as governments go. And you're right, you might have some kind of learning process. But again, part of the deliberation movement is for citizens to for government to find out what citizens believe uh, again you, whether you can do that apropos the previous question in a hurry I don't know um, but you're completely right that the you can interpret the ga I think it's the gamma parameter here as an estimate of the government about what the citizens believe you may not know for sure how many supporters are and over time like you say if it observes in the data you know, nobody's complying with this you know, I'm going on the tube and there's like 70% compliance and then I'm updating my views about gamma. So I think, yeah, absolutely. But then there should be, so, so, so one of the projects I thought, it's actually one of the greatest projects I've ne I'm never gonna do, um, which is that I had this idea of using surveillance camera footage during the pandemic to monitor mask wearing and to find out where people were wearing masks and where they weren't. Because apparently with AI, you can just use all the surveillance but I was told it was an invasion of privacy and never get anywhere. But anyway, but the point is, that was a kind of learning process. How many people really are mask wearers? How many aren't? We had no idea. Like, I'd never worn a mask before this pandemic, so, you know, we didn't really know. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark. Yeah, Tim, very interesting. Um, you've presented political economy as an exercise in reason, um, but I wonder if a lot of politicians don't actually see political economy more as an exercise in emotion. And um, there are studies in the social sciences, as you know, there's warm glow theory and game theory um, about feeling good about doing the right thing. There's shame in sociology, where the group disapproves of your behavior. There's guilt in psychology, where you punish yourself for doing things you think are wrong. And I'm just wondering whether you feel that there may be a trade-off here between, as it were, appealing to reason and appealing to emotion in terms of the implementation of policy. 
I, that's a great question, which deserves a much longer answer than I'm going to be able to give in the one minute we have a, a, uh, uh, available. Um, so, so the way, the way I think, I I'm, I'm, I'm guess I'm a Burkean at the end of the day. So Edmund Burke, for those who don't know, kind of had this view that why, why do we have representative democracy at, at all? Because you know, we have a hope of at least reflective policymaking if we delegate policymaking to those whose job it is to make it on our behalf. But they shouldn't be mandated to do what we want, partly because you try to some extent to, to have a, an, an element of public reason making policy. Now, there is a risk that you bring that through deliberation, you bring back all the emotion and that's what you get. But I I guess I'm moderately, in the deliberative exercises I've seen, which is very, very limited number, um, it, after a while it seems that a lot of those emotional things do sort of drain away and people start thinking in a relatively analytical and non-emotional way about it. And then you don't want to make policy on the back of that. You want to hand that back to the policymakers and say, look, this is what we learned. Now I still want you to do your normal, rational, uh, public reason-oriented role. Because I completely agree with you. If we let uh, emotion, guilt, shame, everything like that run our politics and our policy, we are in a very dangerous place. Now, in election campaigns, that's off the leash. But thankfully, what happens out of election campaigns is often a lot more sane and rational than what happens in election campaigns. And we do have a whole system set up where reason and reflection can most often dominate policymaking relative to all of those uh, psychological forces that you describe. And I view deliberation as helping in that. Um, I rather think we're out of time. We have finally got a question online. <laughs> <laughs> but from someone from Reading. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm delighted to be chairing this session. And I think you've been a wonderful audience. You've proved how important it is we get back to real physical meetings because there's been a really wonderful set of questions. So. Thank you very much uh, for being here, being here for the presidential lecture. But of course, thank you to Tim for giving us such a great lecture that prompted all these wonderful questions. So I'd like to thank Tim again. Thank you.